Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach. And this episode, Olympian Bernard Keter reveals his process to progress through years of continued growth in the sport Mm -hmm. of running. You'll want to hear that interview as well as stick around for the latest from the world of running, including the NCAA Indoor National Championships, fast results from the Nagoya Marathon, and more high school records. Mm -hmm. Speedy ones. All of these things are good. And all of these things are better if you're also a subscriber. So go to a to z running.com, look for the word follow, and then find us in the place where you find the stuff you like to find. Like YouTube, we're there. Mm-hmm. Podcast platforms, we're on Apple, we're on Google, we're on all the common ones. And certainly social media, Instagram is our most common place of connection. Mm-hmm. Well, we have another comment. We love to feature these. And this one is a deep one. So let's get going with it. I'm Bill the Questioner, who asks about the number of long runs a person should do before a marathon. My friend Bill Schutte is doing several 22-plus milers before Boston. You addressed my question in your episode previously. In general, I agree with your approach, where a runner should increase intensity as the race gets closer but get more volume and earlier in the training cycle. There are, however, a couple factors that have me doing fewer long runs. First is my age. I'm 59, and I know I'm more prone to injury than a younger runner who does high mileage. Secondly, I've been doing marathons since the fall of 2009 and have stayed consistent in all that time, doing four to five races per year. When the next marathon is approaching, I typically increase volume, starting with long runs in the 13-14 mile range and then adding a mile or two per week leading up to the race. When I'm doing several marathons a year, it changes the way I approach each one. This might make some interesting discussion for a future episode, which it does. Thank you, Bill. (laughs) What advice would you give to a runner who has a busy racing schedule? That is indeed a busy racing schedule. Um, So doing four to five races per year, I'm assuming those are not all marathons. Uh, The intimation here is not necessarily that they are. They Um, might be. They could be. But that's a lot of marathons, and that certainly would influence the answer here because you would definitely respond to this differently if you're doing that many marathons in a year than if you're not. So I'm going to operate under the assumption that you're not running four to five marathons in a year, Bill, only because I didn't see that when I was looking at your schedule um, in in your Strava posts. But now, in saying that, I appreciate the question here because do these considerations then in an immediate context change the recommendation? So the recommendation, if you recall, when we were talking about Bill's schedule – we were saying that build a questioner and build an athlete, right? Um, so build the athlete's schedule. Uh, we were saying that we were trying to build him up to um, his substantial long run to then sustain that long run for several weeks before entering the taper period mm-hmm. before the race. Um, this will be the approach with nearly every distance runner um, in terms of like what's the best recommendation. The best recommendation is to build volume. As, as early as you need to begin training so that you can build your volume to your maximum sustainable volume for like eight or more weeks. Right. This, yeah. This so, might not be like your max mileage though. Uh, it depends. It, there's a lot of nuance here. But the point is then you want to be running your maximum volume or thereabouts for several weeks, eight to 10 in fact. Um, why? Because you're trying to build fitness and that maximum volume is the thing that's helping you build fitness the most, Mm -hmm. more than the intensity workouts you're doing. Certainly, um, on the whole, as an aerobic runner, we need lots of quality aerobic running. I want to highlight the word Zach used, which was sustainable. Yeah. We're not talking about like, you're going to hit a peak volume week and then, you know, injure yourself if you keep doing it because that's too much clearly. So what is the maximum sustainable? And we do all of this stuff based off time. So Bill, the questioner, asked about a specific distance long run. We don't ever recommend a a distance for our athletes to do long runs. It's always like two hours, two and a half hours. Certain things could be, but almost never. There's like three times we'll say a distance. Um, So that being the case, then the rationale here is you're going to be running a certain amount of time for your long run, and you're going to do that repeatedly 
over a long stretch of time because that's what's going to help you build the adaptations necessary to endure a marathon well. We talk a lot about things like what does it take to get past the wall? What does it take to train uh, for a marathon in a way that the marathon doesn't destroy you every time you do it? All that kind of stuff, right? Well, this is the bulk of it. it. It comes down to this kind of thing. So then when Bill, the questioner, asks about, okay, so what if I'm doing lots of races, even if I'm doing multiple marathons in a year, um, and then this idea of, okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna start when I'm getting ready for a marathon, I'm going to start gearing up for it and build up towards something as many do. So the answer, of course, here is the first line of defense is if I am starting to prepare for a marathon and starting to build up to it, let's say 12 or 16 weeks out from the race, that might not be early enough. If it's taking me 10 weeks to build up my long run to the point where I'm, I'm at like my maximum long run before I begin my taper, um, then I should be starting those 10 weeks, 10 weeks before 10 weeks before the race, because I want to be sustaining it for that time. Now, Bill also mentioned, well, what I'm doing lots of races. So this, this is what it comes down to. If I am doing four or five marathons in the year, I'm not doing 20 week training schedules every time I do one. Um, but I'm also probably, I'm assuming taking time off after each of those races, so in this instance, your scenario is very different because you simply don't have enough time. If you're doing four marathons in a year, you don't have enough time to do a full schedule for each marathon. So then guess what I would say? Pick two of them and have them be priority races on the year and do a full schedule for only two of those races. And then the other ones are, um, you could say, kind of like part of your training progress. And mm -hmm. so in, in which case you're actually still doing the same experience we're describing, but one of those long runs during your training cycle happens to also be a full marathon race that you're doing. And of course you would not, the next week after a marathon would not be a normal training week. It'd be a little adapted. But so there's a lot of so many nuances. nuance. And also how we do long runs. We want to mention that too, because if you're running long run workouts every week that are then very, you're very long, doing something wrong, you're not, you're not <laughs> able to recover. And I can see much. that being problematic. So the way that we suggest doing these long runs, well, you have this, this volume that you're sustaining is to do it very easy. So that means one week, if you're two hours and 30 minutes gets you less than another week because you need to listen to your body, that's going to happen. Good. Good, I say, um, be because that's exactly it. So you got to get the effort right, but you also have to understand what I'm trying to do in training and how the things that I'm doing are helping prepare me for my primary goal. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things need to be clarified, all of those things involved in the conversation. And when we talk with an athlete about developing a season of training, all of that is going to be present in the decisions we make. So it doesn't look the same for every athlete all the time. Instead, it's what do I need within my current plans and constraints. And very few of our athletes can do 22 miles in the duration that we prescribe. So doing several 22 mile long runs might not be what you end up doing. Yeah, no, that only happens if your easy running pace, even your like your jogging pace is and is fast enough that you're covering 22 miles within the time right. frame that we set. So most athletes are not doing uh, that, several that is not a common 22 thing. <laughs> mile long runs. Yeah. So we also want to clarify on that. Good point. Good point, Andy. <laughs> so this is great. We, this is great why we appreciate questions in context because it helps to address the question more fully when we have the details that surround these things. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. And certainly continue the conversation. If there are other thoughts you have based off of those responses, we'd love to continue hearing them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're looking for a spring race, check out Rivertown Races in Grand Rapids, Michigan. What a race it is indeed. Yeah, there's a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon in Millennium Park. And you can use the code A2Z, A-T-O-Z, 2021 for 10% off. And this is especially great because the timing's perfect. It's like end of April. So many of us are looking for spring goal races in May-ish, June-ish. If you're doing Grandma's Marathon, if you're doing uh, the local favorite Bayshore Marathon or all those kinds of things, the timing is excellent. And so always looking for a good race at the right time. This might be it. Now let's get on to our main topic. It takes a lot of diligence and reflection to practice being honest and being patient. And today's episode will be about that and what we need as we progress to find out what we're capable of. In this episode, we hear the inside reflections of Bernard's progression that led to his 3,000-meter steeplechase at the Tokyo Olympic Games representing Team USA. 
So a little about Bernard Keeter. Bernard is a specialist in the United States Army while running professionally with the U.S. Army World Class Athlete Program. Bernard Keeter was the NJCAA's 3,000 meters meter steeplechase champion, an NAIA national champion in cross country, the 5,000 meter indoor and the steeplechase outdoor champion, and was a four-time Big 12 champion and an NCAA first team All-American. In 2019, Keeter was fourth at the Pan Am Games. That's a very competitive international competition in the 3,000 meter steeplechase and was the Army 10 miler runner up. Now, in 2021, which we're going to talk a lot about in this episode, Keeter claimed silver at the U.S. Olympic team track and field trials in Eugene. Just a month later, he ran another personal best in Monaco, tuning up for the Olympic Games, where he ran yet another PR (laughs) and earned 11th place at the Olympic Games in the 3000 meter steeplechase. So in this conversation with Bernard, we discuss how he implemented the phrase, be honest, be patient, to help him pursue greater and greater heights in his running career. Let's hear from Bernard. Hi, Bernard. Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast. Uh, Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. First of all, congratulations on being an Olympian and running a PR at the Olympic Games and getting 11th place. That's absolutely fantastic. So congratulations, first off. Thank you so much. Well, today we're talking about something that you have written on your Instagram page that I thought would be kind of cool as a topic and a guiding point in unpacking your story and unpacking some of this wisdom that you've learned in your running career. And that's be honest, be patient, which is very hard for a lot of us runners to do. So first off, I would love for our audience to hear from you what that means. What does it mean Uh, to be honest and be patient? Being honest, it's just from the dictionary, it just means what it is, but in the running career for any athlete, it means something different. Uh, Because, you know, we're not going to be defining dictionary every time we run on the track. So it's be honest to, you know, what you've already signed up for, which is running. And um, honest in in the sense that um, you have, if every time you're training and you don't see the results, you know, they usually say that Rome wasn't built in one day. So of course you you have to take time to be honest to what you and your coach or what your goals are, if it's making the Olympic team, going to the World Championships, breaking the records and everything. So you have to be, you know, you know, honest. Like the records are not easy to be broken, but it can be broken. So you have to be honest. Like, you know, we can talk about like the, the steep watches right now. The record has been standing for over, I think, 18 years or something, which is 753. So if I can be honest to myself, if I'm going to get the record, I'm just going to be fooling myself. Because mm-hmm. it's need a hard work. You need to really work really hard to chase the standard, to 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 chase the record. If you want to break the record, you you have to be honest to yourself. It's gonna be hard to get it. And um, you know, being patient. It's you know, if you, you can chase the record for three years, you know what I mean. You can run this year, run eight of eight or five. Next year, seven fifty two. Yeah, you know, seven fifty three, and then the next, the third year, you can get the 753 which is a world record so you have to be honest it's gonna it's not gonna be easy but it's attainable and then you have to be patient when do you want to get it and are you gonna get it so you have to tell yourself all those truths like yes i'm going to get it and i'm going to be patient to get it Hmm. that's some deep wisdom there it's so true they go hand in hand i have to be honest where am i at right now what are these goals that i have and i have to have the patience i can't skip the steps in running we just we can't skip the steps that we need to get to our goals. So let's rewind back to when you were a youth runner. Can you tell us about your thoughts about running and the steeplechase? I know you're, you had some family influence there. Can you tell us what your uh, mindset was getting into the sport of running? Uh, what do you mean being youth? I don't remember. Like, cause I, I grew up, I was born in, and I grew up in Kenya. So we didn't have like the structured um, sports, like what I've seen here in the United States. So pretty much I, you know, we, we, we didn't have like the soccer, the running team, the whatever, like for the, for the young kids and everything. So I pretty much, actually, I started running after high school. 
Mm -hmm. I, I usually think about um, how I ended up, because I was talking to one of my friends, uh, I think three days ago, uh, Morgan Pearson, uh, from uh, E-Trends down in Colorado. So I was like, I don't see myself as talented. I think I'm a hard worker. I think I've worked hard to where I am. Uh, of course, you know, you have a, you need to have a little bit of talent to improve with the hard work to get to where you are. But, you know, if you just, you know, say you have a talent and you just sleep all day, you don't go work out, you know, they, they, you need to work hard to get to what you want and to get to where you are. And, you know, so pretty much like growing up, my brother ran the Olympics in 20, 2008 in Beijing. So it pretty much influenced me to do the steeple because growing up and when I started training with him, it was more of like I had more speed. So he thought I should be a 1500 runner, but I was like, no, I don't want to do 1500. Because I look at the, the world record for 15 was like 326. I'm like, dang, that's really quick. And then I was like, I thought I did, I did the high jump in primary school. So I thought I had um, the ability to jump over stuff. So I was like, I'm just going to include my running ability and my jumping ability to do the steeple chase. So that's how I ended up running the steeple. That's a hard event. I had read somewhere doing some research uh, what you said about the steeplechase. It's not just a physical event, but more of a mental event. So when we talk about patience, the steeplechase involves maybe more tactical patience maybe than others because it does tax more of you with the jumping included in the barriers. Could you talk us through what patience means specifically for the steeplechase event? Oh, that's actually it's gonna I think I hope this reaches a lot of people because uh a lot of people don't know even what steeplechase is. Like most people are like, what is the steeplechase? So steeplechase usually actually you can run in two different styles. There is a track you jump through uh you go through the water in, inside. So that's when you do you don't jump the barriers until that starting line. So you run freely almost have a lap with no barriers and then the the one you have to jump outside you start and you jump the steeplechase barrier just right there so you know being patient the same thing like with the being steeplechase you have to know okay if i'm running through outside i'm gonna run you know you're still running three thousand meters but it's it's it tells you like it's seven laps but it's not because you're going outside the track so you have to be patient you're not going to be running at 400 meters you're just not going to hit the bell and you're like I'm, i want to run 60. you have to be patient like okay it's going to be more than 400 meters so you have to be really patient if you're running through outside the war uh that's the track and then you know it's 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 steeper chase it's it's more of again of a mental event that I, I don't know if that's on the books but i uh, like since i've been running i've told myself it's more of like a a mental race than just being physical because um at the beginning it's just gonna be easy but you know when you are at the fourth fifth lap those barriers gonna grow higher than what you think. So you have to be patient that, you know, at the fifth lap or at the seventh lap to going through the bell, uh, going to the bell, you have to know those barriers are not gonna be the same size as when you start. So you, cause of course you're getting fatigued, you're getting tired, you know, you're getting beat, you want to be whatever position you want to be either winning or being top three or just giving yourself a goal in a race. And um, being uh, that being said, it's like you have to be patient. Like those barriers, you it is it's the same physically on the track, but in the race, it's get it keep growing higher and higher. Like yeah, so you have to be really patient. You know, when do you think you have more strength? If it's you know, uh, so that's why like you have to really train for it. Like it's not just like as you know, 5K, you have no barriers, you have no nothing, 1,500, it's just like steeplechase is more of like, you have to prepare like mentally, like it's going to be hard at some point. Yeah. So. 
Yes, yes. I have very limited experience. I did run in college, but that was the most difficult event. And for the reason that you're saying, because at the end, it gets harder and harder to jump the barriers. And seeing a strong professional steeplechaser like yourself is just incredible. Like at the Olympic trials, when you and Hillary Bohr are, you have you have so much strength. So in the finish, you guys were sprinting. And it's just, it's incredible to see that. But it does take some patience and knowing yourself and being honest and preparing for this really hard event and hard work that you're going to do in the steeplechase event. So it's cool to hear from your perspective, like what it's what it's like and getting yourself in that framework. Speaking of which, how how do you get yourself into that mindset for race day when you're pushing some boundaries of what you've done before, what's possible? I mean, was it in 2021 that you got an 11 second PR or 12, 12 over the year because you got another PR at the Olympic Games? Um, how do you press the boundaries of what's possible while still checking in with yourself and making sure you have it for the end? I mean, like, um, you, you need to have the foundation, just like any other buildings, any other uh, things you do in your career, like, you know, you have to start somewhere. So pretty much you need to have a really good foundation of like doing the strength stuff before you start doing the speed. Cause uh, I usually actually, I don't know, if I'm going to get in trouble with this, but a lot of commentators of a lot of people, they usually say, oh, so-and-so have like, you know, the fastest 1500 meters in the race or the fastest mile in the race. That's if we are running steeplechase, no matter how fast you're running 1500 or 800, it's going to be different. Like you're not going to have the, the better kick than the other people because all of you, you are running 3000 meters or you are running 5000 meters. If you don't have the strength to the point whereby your peers lies, like you have the quickest miler in the field. If you don't have the strength to the point whereby you have a mile to go and already I'm ahead of you, you're not going to kick crazier than, you know, like, you know, I was watching Kipchoge last night and, you know, you can tell me Jacob and is in, and it's going to outkick Kipchoge because he has the fastest 1500. It's not going to work. So, you know, so you have to have the endurance to be added to the speed that you have. Mm -hmm. So pretty much like uh, uh, my coach and, you know, and Hillary, you know, and again, it's the team that we have down here in Colorado Springs, because uh, going from Hillary is uh, Shadrach, you know, Lenny, we, we have a lot of Olympians in our group, Chelimo, Paul Chelimo is here with us. I'm here. I just made the team the other day, uh, last year. So it's pretty much the team that we have that pushes you, you know, and uh, actually after, um, you know, every time, like, because I raced three races before Olympic trials last year, and I was seeing a lot of people uh, posting on their uh, social media, like, don't be surprised if we're not made the team. Actually, Morgan Pearson again posted that on his um, Twitter account, like, don't be surprised if we're not made the team. So I was like, wait a minute, there's a lot of people out there who are, who are cheering for you. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of people out there. They have, you know, even if you don't believe yourself, you can take someone's belief and you nurture that belief until you have your own, you know what I mean? So I was like, if there is someone out there who believe I can make the team, I don't want to let them down. So I was like, I'm going to work the best. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to work so hard, not to disappoint myself, but not to disappoint all those people that they are putting their money on me. I was like, you know, uh, keep supporting us, you know, like, we, we like there's a lot of people there's a lot of people like of course you know like you have usually people just have like 15 people in the in the starting line of course everybody wants to win but someone else you have your own supporters there's some some people cheering for you so you don't have to let all those people down cheering uh don't let the people cheering for you down and you know hillary it's been a really good motivation to me like being a 808 guy and uh, being my training mate and um you know we, we push each other a lot we push each other a lot if um uh if i'm having a bad day you know it's just like you know you have to do this you know you have to do this like trials gonna require you being able to be at the you know advancing to the finals and being able to run the prelims and to run the finals in like what three days or whatever so it's it's, be, it's been a really 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 good um 
motivating factor me being down here it on the stipoche side but of course everybody on the team because we you know you, we go to the trials and then you see paul making the team you see shad drug making the team and then the stipoche is the last race to be raised and then you'll be like oh all my teammates have made the team so you have to like switch your mind really quick like okay i'm not gonna be the only one remaining you know i have you know we have to make the team as as a team that's really special to have your training group believe in you so much and also you elevate one another and that's really cool and as you're doing this process i, I read somewhere you wrote it's improving yourself not proving yourself and that was also a key factor to the patients because if we're enjoying the process of improving ourselves and we're around people, surrounded by people who elevate us, that helps us stay in that patient mindset and not feel frantic, you know? They believe in you. They they knew you could do it. You knew you could too. And I think that's really cool that you sharpen each other and build each other up. So mm -hmm. let's talk actually, about- Actually, actually on, the, on, the, on the improving yourself, not improving yourself, I, I can talk about that. It's more yeah. like, um, you know, as, as much as I have Hillary and as my competitor on my team, because uh, we had uh, like last year going to Olympic trials, we had seven athletes from my team in the same event. And imagine how people do you need to make the team? Three people, you know? So out of seven steeple chases in our training group, and you add another to watch like a lot of you know, in the old United States. So uh, apart from coming from my team, seven competitive people from my team, you have to, you know, you have again to have that competition within yourself, not within the group. And then again, if it's, when it's come to a race day, you have to compete with, it, your, with your teammates, you know what I mean? So of course we train, we wake up and we train like, you know, we meet for training uh, speed walks, we meet for like long runs, we meet for everything. That's with training as a group. But when it's come to a race, you know, of course I want to make the team. If I wants to make the team, like so and so want to make the team. So on the train during the training, we have to help ourselves. And then during the race day, you know, it's gonna be, you know, man for himself and God for us all. So pretty much. And then again, so don't try to I like the uh pr proving yourself not uh, uh um, like improving yourself, not proving yourself was, you know, I don't want to be a cocky guy saying I can beat so and so and can beat so and so. I have to improve myself because being um, since I was in college, I think the highest position in college I finished was sixth place. Because I went to this cross country in Terrawood, Indiana, and I finished 131 in cross country. So I was, I looked at myself, I'm like, wait a minute. You know, so I was like, I need to improve myself. And then like this past uh, January, I just went to the U.S. cross country and I finished fifth. So I was like, I came mm -hmm. all the way from running in college, finishing 131 to finishing fifth in the United States championship trials, uh, championship uh, cross country championships. So it's, you know, you seeing how far you have come and how far do you want to go and you know every other time you improve yourself from you know from point a to point b you know going forward don't what, what i what, what i meant by you know improving your service like do not try to you know go to a race and thinking you're not going to get beat of course i don't know what my competitor is doing in flagstaff in mammoth lake in whatever the rest of the country when we meet on the race day, of course, they bring their A game, I have my A game. So it's gonna be, what have you been doing all this time? What am I been doing? So it's gonna be, it's gonna end up being, you know, did I improve myself from where I was a year ago or three weeks ago or a week ago? You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, like to, at the beginning of uh, our season last year, my peer was 829. And then I ended up running like 8.17. So it was like, you know, am I going to prove myself just running 8.30s? Or am I going to improve myself to to be better of the fashion of what, what I am? You know, just improve the fashion of yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is such a journey. And there's a lot of our listeners have been running a really long time. And would you, it sounds like you'd encourage them to look back on the progress to keep 
that mindset of improving. Is that right? Yep. Because it's, it's sometimes easy to get stuck in like where we are and like where we want to be and not be focused on the improvement that's possible. And each day with the patients, we show up, we do the work. And I think it's really motivating to hear your story. You know, you're at the NAIA, which I went to NAIA. So like I, I, I cheer loud for the NAIA superstars, you know. Uh, so you're at the NAIA national champion then go to NCAA and you see this progress to then competing at the Olympic stage. And it's cool to see that progress. So what would you tell someone who maybe is – Maybe there's listeners today who are just beginning. And what would you tell them as far as being patient and being honest with themselves? Actually, you missed one division. I was in, I was, I went to JUCO for one year in uh, Cloud County Community College in Kansas before I transferred to Wayland Baptist in Texas and later went to Texas Tech. So I won the steeplechase in NJCA in 2014, born 2015 for NAIA, and I went to Texas Tech, and then I got beat really bad. In 2016 Nationals, I was, I finished 10th, and then 2017, my last year, I finished sixth. So, you know, again, I like going to junior college, I have always wanted to run, I wanted to run at a, the Division One school and uh, getting the opportunity from, you know, going from junior college to Texas Tech to, you know, competing at the Olympics and making the finals. It was more of like, um, you know, like, what, what are you doing? Are you just gonna be stuck to where you are? Uh, or, you know, are you gonna improve? Because uh, in junior college, actually, I think that my first steeplechase was like 9.22. I went like 9.22 and then I went like 9.18. And then, you know, I went to nationals. I won the national with like 9.06, something like that. And then my previous year, I went to Texas Relays and then I ran 9.47. And my coach from uh, Wayland was like, hey, how did you do that? I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, hey, it's altitude down here. I'm like, what is altitude? So, so you know, like I, my goal was just to run under nine and I didn't know how fast I was running. So I ended up running from like 9.05, 9.06, 9.05 like nine, uh, eight forty seven. So it was that the, the improvement that you tell yourself you want, of course, to, to continue running like past where you are. And always, always, I will always wanted to, you know, to be at the division one, you know, to compete at the NCA, just like, you know, everybody else, any kid out there who wants to go to this, you know, whatever school they they choose to to compete at the NCA. So uh, the goal was, you know, you know, just like take one step at a time. You know, listen to your coaches, improve yourself. You know, like mostly do more of um, looking back and you know where where was i yesterday you know what am i supposed to do from here going forward and you know learning from every other race you know like you might go to a race and you know you, you thought you were ready and you took off like a bullet and you know you just became a pacemaker and everybody's just gonna be behind you and you know i'll kick you at the end of it and then you have to learn sometimes there's some fast races of course yes you have to go with the pace and then there's some championship races you just have to you know chill in there and just you know, get the positioning, but, you know, yeah. So it's more of like, you know, keep improving yourself more of like, um, focusing more of what you need to do. And, you know, again, be patient, be patient, be patient, don't rush. Cause there was a book, I forgot what the name, what the name of the book. Uh, when I was in junior college, this, uh, my coach from junior college, um, gave me this book and then I read, I forgot the name. I actually look for it. So this book was like, you know, that's why like most of the time when I'm injured, I try to take the, to take medication or, you know, you know, do the rehab, do and everything. So the, you know, so the book was like, if you're trying to achieve your best, it was, it was a running book about the guy who went to run in Kilimanjaro and some stuff. I actually look at which book was that. So there was this line which says, uh, you know, the journey might take 
you know, might take like short time to reach your destination. But if you are injured as a runner and you, 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 you keep running through your injury, it might take long. Actually, the book specified it was might take you 12 years to reach to where you're going instead of taking, you know, two, three or four. You know, mm. so you know, like usually, like if I'm if I'm feeling something is not good, I have to like, you know, take care of. What, what I have to find out what is it. If a really bad injury, of course, take off, do rehab. You know, get all the support you need from, you know, the athletic trainers, the you know, or you know, the massage therapist and everything. So the the book was like it was gonna take longer as you. Would have loved to. So, uh, so again, you know that's pretty much. You know, be patient. If you're getting, if you're injured, you know, you know, to t- take a time back. You know, look at because you, you can be running with a stress fracture. Of course, it's gonna be something different. You know, if you keep running, you think you, you're gonna heal your injury, and you know, so because again, you know, in twenty when was it? 2020 before Olympics was cancelled, uh, Olympic trial, uh, Olympic trial, uh, Olympics was postponed to 2021. I was actually injured in 2021, and then I started running in May 1st, 2020, and then the Olympic trials was supposed to come, uh, was supposed to take place in June, sometimes in June. Yeah. So I gave, I gave myself 30 days. I was gonna be like, I'm gonna train for 30 days just for one month and i was gonna because I, i've already qualified to get to just get into the finals from 2019 i had the qualification standard to go in but i didn't have the olympic qualification so i was like i just gonna give myself 30 days because i i was pain free i was injury free i was gonna do my best to give myself like 30 days of training so hard and I was, I was gonna make sure I was gonna be the finals. I don't know if I was gonna make the team, but I was gonna use my thirty days to train so hard, and um, and make just the finals. I don't know if I was gonna make the team in twenty twenty, or you know, or I don't know if I was gonna like try to run for that thirty days so hard, and I was gonna go back to you know, injured or something. But you know, mm-hmm. you know, Olympics being postponed to twenty twenty one was just a blessing from the sky. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then you were in the Olympic final, <laughs> you know, it was magical. Actually, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To go from that spot where you're injured and you're, you're wondering what's going to happen next to having the ability to, to fully rehab and then to train and have a great season and then start PRing and improving constantly. It was a, it was a joy to watch. It was so fun to cheer for you. Team USA uh, at the Olympic games. It was, it was so fun. So as we're thinking about your career and your life and how you have approached uh, your your running and then just how that process fits in with your life. What would you like to tell our listeners who are, you know, they're they're balancing life and they're running. They care about their running. Uh, our audience are also fans of running, so they follow the professional sport too. Would, what would you like to tell our audience as they're they're trying to practice being patient and practice being honest in their daily lives? Be honest and be patient. <laughs> Like I mean, like like myself, I, I'm I'm not just a runner. I, I I'm 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 an active military soldier. You know, I'm I'm a full time active so, uh, soldier, and you know, you know, I have my military life and I have the running life. So pretty much, like you can do both. You know, you just have to be on the schedule whereby you can do um you know time management, like when do you want to run, when do you want to you know when are you at work, you know? So pr- pretty much like you have to navigate through a lot of stuff. So I understand the challenge of, you know, you might go to work and, you know, like even right now it's snowing down here. So if someone was to go to work and get out like at what, at four or five and thinking you were going to run, do the workout in the truck, it's not possible, you know what I mean? So it's pretty much doing, uh, what I usually tell myself, it's don't think too much just be within where you are. Don't try to reach what's unreachable. You know what I mean? Just work, work within your schedule whereby you can um, 
you know, give yourself maybe two hours, may, maybe an hour in the morning or an hour in the evening to to train and go to work. If you, your job requires too much, like me myself, we have sometimes we have to go to the range. We have to go. We do a lot, like you. And um, mostly, you just have to, you know, before you even go to bed, you have to plan your schedule for tomorrow. Like, okay, I'm gonna go to work at this time. My my break, my my lunch break is like one hour, thirty minutes. I'm gonna run for one hour. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take my lunch for the next thirty minutes. So you have to really plan what's within your schedule for tomorrow for for the whole week actually. So it's it's pretty much it's. I understand it's re- really hard. It's really hard to walk through doing, you know, running, being a runner and, you know, working full time and everything. But it's it, it's doable if, you know, I, I'm not saying I, I'm the best example to be used, but it's doable. You know, I, I know I'm not the only one who, who, who does all this. You know, there, there are students, you know, there are some people who after college maybe they're doing their masters they're doing their phds and everything and at the same time they're runners you know what i mean so they still have to figure out you know because i mean like if you're a student running you know most of i think 90 percent of the runners like more than i think 98 percent or even 100 percent of the runners here in the united states and some western countries They've been through college, you know what I mean. So mm-hmm. once at one time in their career, they were student athletes, you know what I mean. So if you are still taking your master's, your PhD at the professional level of your career, you know what's expected of you. You know you still have to have time management, really good, and work through your schedule. And just the same, same, same as someone who goes to work, like waking up in the morning, go to work, and you know just run. You know you can have a treadmill come home like a five and just go run on your treadmill and you know getting put in the work put in the work yeah, yeah and scheduling it i do think it's so important for us to see what we do have control of and then managing our time and it's so good to hear from you who are, you're doing thank you first of all for representing our country and working for our country and then performing and running for our country so thank you for that you do it so well um but yeah like you're you're not immune to busyness of life and it's great to hear from you and talk about how this process in our lives can always be something that we're looking at and proving and not proving ourselves and also being honest and patient and seeing that progress along the way you know coming from the njcaa all the way to the olympics so thank you so much bernard thanks for coming on the show Uh, You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And um, until next time. Thank you to Bernard for sharing his story and his wisdom with us. I wish we would have more time to even dive in further to what he's up to and what he's doing. Briefly, he had mentioned his cross country season. And I wanted to mention that he was fifth at the U.S. Cross Country Championships. Nice. Yeah. And he also ran a 5K indoor PR this year. So he's in great form, and we look forward to keeping you up to date on what Bernard is doing. Well, that's exciting. Speaking of updates on what people are doing, let's get on to the world of running. We're always excited to give major props to our A to Z runners. And this week, Laura ran the Heart Mini Marathon in a cold, cold day. And she ran a solid performance. So congrats to Laura. Excellent work. Now, number one on the list for World of Running here is the NCAA Indoor National Championships. Always an exciting event. Indoor championships especially is an interesting one because the track is so small. Um, they look like they're running especially fast. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I only say that simply because I'm always marveling as I'm watching, you know, these collegians running 5,000 meters and it looks like they're at a dead sprint the entire time. And they have to move the camera so fast because they can't pull away as far as right. they do an outdoor track. <laughs> so it's like the camera's like whipping around. Anyway, so it's fun to watch, but especially fast were the likes of a number of individuals here with yeah. some outstanding performances we wanted to mention. Let's start with Abdi Noor of Northern Arizona. So, um, a backstory. 
a backstory is really important here. And and certainly you can find some more information uh, on this than what we're going to provide here. But Abdi Noor is not the stereotypical like NCAA champion kind of story where, you know, he was like the high schooler that won everything and set all the records, you know, footlocker, 10 time champion, all that kind of stuff. Um, he came out of high school actually wanting to run for Northern Arizona, but not being able to. He he was not qualifying to be able to actually run with their program. And so Coach Mike Smith told him, well, here's what it would take for you to be able to run in the program. And to his credit, Noor went and he, he spent two years in community college and did all the things Mike Smith said. You got to have these things. You got to be able to accomplish this stuff. You got to do this stuff academically, athletically. And he did it all and joined up the program after two years in community college. And in his first year with Northern Arizona, two time NCAA indoor champ. That's a hard double. What too. an incredible. Yeah. So the double was 3000 meters and the 5000 meters. So division division one only recently added 5000 to the indoor circuit. It used to not even be present. And so what they do now is they do a 5000 on Friday and a 3000 on Saturday. So back to back days running two grueling events. And here's how it plays out. Um, so he starts with the 5000 on Friday. And just grinds the field away from a thousand meters out, like pressure on and just flooring it. It was an incredible thing to watch. You should definitely watch it. Um, and runs a new meet record, NCAA national championship meet record of 1319, leads the field through what amounts to essentially um, like nearly everybody running faster than the previous record. There's like four or five guys who ran faster than the previous meet record. Um, and it should know, I said he leads the field through, but we got to give Wesley Kiptu credit where it's yeah. due mm -hmm. because he's the one who just took it out like a firestorm. Um, and he did, in fact, pay for it later and ended up uh, further back in the pack. But but it kept the race fast. Kept it honest, that's mm -hmm. for sure. So he takes the 5,000 in, in, in a blazing kick finish as well on top of everything else. The 3,000 was a little bit closer of an, an ordeal, mm -hmm. uh, but still very tactical, uh, yeah. so very fast late in the race. Late he, in the race, but in the beginning of the race, it was very slow. In fact, it caused a trip up and well, people yeah. fell down. So in indoor track, there's not a lot of space, no. right? Because you're running curves so frequently, um, twice as often, in fact. <laughs> and so you you see these guys running bunched up and, and they're still going pretty quick, but they're not they're not at like they're not extending themselves yet, and so the pack is thick. And then, sure enough, half halfway through the pack, uh, someone trips and it takes down like half of them almost, mm. um, including uh, Noor's teammate, Northern Arizona teammate um, Nico Young, which was a bummer for him because he certainly had his sights set on a top three or, or better performance in that three thousand two. Mm. Um, well, Noor takes it in a, in a blazing kick finish to double up his national championship title, which is really something. But he's not the only no. one. No. So Caitlin Tui was double up. No. Double that, runner double, up. Double runner up. That's hard to say. <laughs> double runner up. So in 24 hours, Tui ran the runner up spot in both the 3,000 and the 5,000 meter runs. And at 19, Caitlin Tui is just like blazing through and she had a rough like end of high school slash beginnings right i mean i feel like it's pretty pressure normal was to have high, a transition so, yeah and she still was doing fine but this is really showing what everyone ex maybe expected to see of her which it's hard these young runners that are very talented reach exceeding amounts of pressure and for her to be able to perform under pressure as such a young runner she was able to flex her her strength in that really difficult double and there was a battle for the 3000 for the women and Taylor Rowe won the women's 3000 meter run in 858.95 ahead wow. of Caitlin Tui who was 859.20 so very close and she held out the major charge that Caitlin Tui had in the very end and in a post-race interview Taylor Rowe said that she could see it on the jumbotron that they were chasing her down and she was terrified <laughs> so that was a, a pretty crazy final there there was three of them up there in the top tier for the victory um so around the final turn it could have been any one of them well I have to say personally I've, I I'm kind of not thrilled with the fact that they do the jumbotron thing on the home stretch wall. So the athletes are watching themselves finish to see who's catching them or not. Um, and so you can see them just all looking at the screen and it's like, man, there's, there's something lost in like that, 
that surprise <laughs> predator prey moment where someone's chasing someone down and they just don't know. So that's, you know, you get them looking over their shoulder uh, all the time, which some people have been caught. You know, you look over your, the wrong shoulder and someone goes by you on yeah. the other side. Anyway. Um, but yes, terror, terror on the home stretch as the saying goes. Well, that, that's incredible. Yeah. And we don't often do any news from sprints, but oh. we find these to be extremely interesting and good things to talk about when it comes to enjoying track and field. And we always talk about how we want to be great fans of the sport. So for us to understand it better can help us in our experience with that. Yeah. So the men's 60 meter had, okay, so they've got these blocks and it's new technology. Mechanical new. blocks is what they're called. Um, haven't they always been mechanical? But anyway, anyway, so, <laughs> adjectives. Um, so that's what they call them. Uh, but they, what they do is the block senses motion and so and pressure. And so when an athlete pushes off the block to start, um, if they do so before the starter clicks the gun, and so it's all electronic now. They're they're both linked to the same system. Um, that's a false start, right? And and we saw this in the Olympic trials last summer, where yeah, there's just the all hurdles. false starts over and over and over several times. And of course, everyone, you know, half the people are blaming the system and half the people are saying, well, the athletes are just too ner nervous and getting yeah. excitable and whatever. Um, the point simply is, is it's a mess, regardless of what the reason is. And this whole automated false start thing is bad news for the sport. Well, see, Zach is kind of taking that side, but I'll play devil's advocate that they want it to be as fair as possible. So they don't want people to be getting away with. A false start. Here's so why it's part of the reason they're trying to make it fair. Currently, bad news for the sport. So Andy's right. It ultimately, it actually is would be better if they do it in a certain way. So the reason why it's bad news for the sport is because the system itself will notify uh, if there's a false start, and the athletes can hear it. And so what happens is the system says false start, but then the starter who's holding the gun has to fire the gun again to indicate the stop of the race. And if they don't, then you have the situation that happened to NCAA's where. Some of the runners, as a matter of fact, one of the race favorites, heard the false start, and so he stopped running. But the starter never fired the second gun, mm -hmm. so everyone else kept running. Yeah. And then what it came down to is, well, hang on a second. The system told them it was a false start, but the rule says you only stop if they fire the second gun. That's way too confusing. It's very complicated. So either you make that sound silent, so the athletes don't know if the system said there was a false start. Only the starter that hears it in their good. ear. That's a good idea. Which everyone's saying would be better. You should write in. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make that up. That was all the let's run oh, message okay. boards were saying that. Um, or you just simply... <clears throat> make the false start sound the gun sound uh -huh. and really loud sure and just play it how it is and, okay uh, which i would not support that one but anyway okay that's it another <laughs> note from mid distance sprinting ish we have randolph ross who won the men's 400 meter final in 44.62 missing the world indoor record by just point zero Five. He is now third on the world all-time indoor list. Wait, so he missed it by point zero five, but he didn't even get second on the list? <laughs> I guess there's a lot in that okay. point zero five. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a range. All right. Well, we always like to see records. That's good. Yes. Nagoya Women's Marathon is a, it's like it says, a women's only marathon. There are very few of these, but they are very, very competitive. Well, let's remember why this is important because in men's race or in joint races, then women are often able to run with packs of men, like the, the upper level women. And so they have, essentially they have the group momentum dynamic that they can benefit from further. So in a women's only race, it creates what they describe as a, a purer form of racing for records purposes for women. So that how fast can a woman run in a race where there's seven men all around her or how fast can a woman run where she's essentially having to do most of the work herself? And that's, of course, mm -hmm. a greater challenge in some instances. So they describe these in, in different ways categories for mm -hmm. records. Ruth Chepnagetich ran the second fastest women's only marathon time in history in 21718 taking the win. Now that was a course record wow. and she won $250,000 for her win, which according to my sources is the biggest first place prize money in the sport. We at least corroborated it against all the marathon majors. Yeah, and it's more well, than what, any of those. Yeah, what was it? Which one was fifty thousand? Uh, like Dubai was fifty thousand, yeah. but that's not a majors. But that one tends to be a big prize uh, yeah. purse too. And so, yeah. So this is a lot of money. Yep. And Ruth came away with it very handsomely because the second place was Sal Peter Lona Sal Peter two eighteen forty five for her, but she did end up challenging Ruth Chepnagetich at one point. So this is kind of how it went down. Huh. At 5,000, 
Ruth took out. And she was running alone for a lot of the race. And then around like 25, 30K, that's when oh. we started to see prevalence from Selpeter. And she was challenging and came came really close to her. And then Ruth just took off again, asserting her dominance and victory in the race. So that was very, very exciting. Brutal. Is this what is it the was. second fastest time ever in Japan for a, for a woman. And it's the second fastest marathon of Ruth's career. Solid. Which is an amazing career if you've been following it. There's You're only on, like three people podcast. who have run faster, or two, or something. So, Bridget yes. Kosge. <laughs> yeah, Brid- Bridget Kosge, world record, yeah. and you know, uh, Paula, basically. Yeah. So there were more incredible performances that happened within this race. We won't get to them all, but here are a couple. Yuka Suzuki claimed the collegiate marathon record and a third place finish in a time of 2.22.22. So that's all twos there. That's all Two, twos? 22, 22. And this was her marathon debut. There was, I mean, there, it was not surprising. It was there not was surprising. There was lots of talk about her yeah. getting that record and possibly better. So, yes. Yeah, Suzuki Good. was the World University Half Marathon Games Gold Medalist in 2019. And this one is a very exciting one as well with the fastest ever marathon run by a 63-year-old, ah. Marquillo Yugeta. And she ran 258.40 to push the age range for the sub three even further because she has continually been running sub three marathons. She is the 60 plus world record holder currently. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So fast marathon times, fast NCAA times. The only thing we're missing right now is high school. High schoolers. So let's talk about some fast high school times. So interestingly enough, there's a lot of discussion around in the United States this past weekend. They had two high school indoor, you quote, championships. There are no official high school national championships of any kind. Um, it's it's all like privatized, which is always interesting to people. So like Nike Nationals, for instance, they have a cross country. It's pretty and widely indoor, accepted and an as the Nationals though. Right. But others occasionally also have a Nationals. And so yeah, you have year. like the Brooks one. The Brooks PR invite is considered a national championship. That's not indoor. That's an outdoor one. But for example, there's a number of these that have cropped up. So in this instance, they did two of them on the same weekend, which was disappointing to a number of people because that meant that some of the runners, some of the best runners in the country who would have gone head to head instead were at separate meets. Um, and so some felt like that was, you know, a missed opportunity uh, for, for a great okay. race, but in the I same token, that. it also meant more opportunity for great races for other people, you know, in the heats too. So sure. anyway, that's what happened. But what happened in terms of results, <laughs> let's start with the boys side, the four by one mile relay, which is always an exciting thing. So this is like the distance runners, um, what, what would you call it, Andy? It's the distance runners party um, because it's the only relay that is, you could say, purely distance runners. Uh, the distance medley relay, is for instance. Is a mile really distance to us anymore? Well, no, it's a middle <laughs> distance runner. But in high school, that's called distance yes, running still. Yeah. So anyway, uh, four by one mile is like a badge of honor to be able to compete well at that. And as you might guess, the Newberry Park boys did do you just Not put like a, a Z on the other? They're like, boys. I'm sure that they do that themselves at some point or other. They are, after all, cool like they me. They are very cool. So in, in the talk ahead of the race, the, the national record, the United States record for four by one is like 17 minutes, right? Um, and and that's, that's quite fast. You know, that's averaging 4.15 a guy. And this is high school boys. Um, but there was all this talk like they could do that no problem. And, you know, big talk, you got to produce big, right? Well, they did. They did. They, in fact, ran 1629. So they beat the previous record by like 31 seconds, 32 so seconds. Um, averaging 407 and change a person. Their anchor leg ran 403. So, like, yes, these boys are fast. What's the kicker, though? Well, I don't know what you mean that by the kicker. That there are two sets of brothers. Yes. So I find that, that fascinating. Yeah. So on your four-man relay, you've got only two families represented. <laughs> um, two bloodlines make for great relay teams, it would seem. Um, and and that's exactly it. The Salmon brothers led off by Aaron and closed by Colin. And then the young brothers, the twins, in the middle there. Um, these are the younger brothers of Nico Young we mentioned earlier. Yeah. So clearly there's a bloodline there that has some fast running. Um, They're coming for you, Ingebrigtsen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But uh, they not only ran a new high school national record, they also, in fact, ran the eighth fastest ever 
by any level in the United States. So like college, pro, anything. Um, granted, professionals don't do four by one mile relays. That often, but they'll occasionally uh, do it. Like the Bowerman Track Club has done it. They, they, that they do the that summer. as like an exhibition occasionally. Yeah, but, I know, but still. So to say it's the eighth fastest all it. time doesn't necessarily mean that others couldn't just go in and run fast. I mean, who knows? But the point is. It's fast. It's fast. It's fast. <laughs> it's very fast. And we okay. can be impressed and celebrate that. They did say in an interview video, which is a great video to watch, by the way, hearing them talk about it, it's kind of funny. Um, they, they've got lots of interesting comments, which I always enjoy. What do they have to say? Mm -hmm. One of the comments was, that was the first time they'd ever handed off to each other. Yeah. In the race. <laughs> so, you know, um, in sprints, if, if your handoffs aren't dialed in, you got nothing. You, you got to have that. But for distance running... It's not really that big of a deal. I mean, handoffs are kind of scrappy lot, at best. And they had the record by a uh, lot. Right. <laughs> uh, but it is kind of funny. They're like, oh, they yeah. They dialed it in. Really maybe they could get a couple seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe. Right. So that but was that not the only all. record. Yeah. The high school girls four by mile national record also was broken by Saratoga. And the school depth was incredible with two teams at the national event. So eight girls from the eight same girls, high school team. Yeah. Were Only all one got the record, the but event. they were all very fast. And yeah. the record time was by Ella Curdo, Alicia Hart, Mackenzie Hart, and Emily Bush in a time of 1949.1. And they beat the record set by the 2005 Saratoga team by 10 seconds. Nice. Which was a lot too, right? And their team was so deep that their B team ran the 15th fastest time in high school history. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's amazing. So that for the first four there, they averaged 457 and change. Which all is under crazy fast for they said, four girls. I watched the interview and they were feeling really good coming into this because yeah. they had all broken five minutes this season. And so they were excited to see what they could do together. Saratoga has a history of having fast milers. They had the 2005 team, mm. but last uh, outdoor season, they achieved the four by one mile national record in the outdoor season. So, so they're, they're just kind of knocking now them they down. Now they have outdoor and indoor records. Set it up, knock them down. This is good stuff. This is really incredible performances. Um, now, those are like the, the best of the high school, but what about the youngest and what they're doing? So this one, Not Keegan children. Smith, a freshman from Tennessee, Knoxville Catholic to be exact, set the new freshman class record in the mile, um, which, by the way, the class records – are, are something that aren't necessarily attended to as often. Um, but the freshman one in particular is always an interesting one because yeah. it's, you know, your first year in high school, very few people are like at performance level yet. Um, but they don't have as much man, development. You see this happen yeah. sometimes and you're like, wow. So he ran 414. 414. Yes, which is also the eighth best time in Tennessee indoor history altogether. So fastest freshman national record, but also, um, you know, there aren't that many other Tennessee boys who have run faster mm -hmm. than that at all great oh by the way it's a full six seconds faster than his previous best so running a, a big massive PR. pr to do it as yeah. well which you know you can hope that uh he's just on you know just on the path of development here and yeah. so he's just going to continue walking down that road and we would love to see how he and where he develops yeah and he's no stranger to records he also ran the nation's fastest high school 5k on grass in 2021 for the cross country season so indeed yeah that well as it happens that's all we've got in the world of running at the moment simply because we're time our time is <laughs> up just for this week though so don't be sad you can subscribe to the podcast and you can get an episode every week that is exactly the way you want to do it you need to go to a to z running.com look for the word follow to make sure that you don't miss out on any of the rest of the great content we're sharing or even the stuff that isn't just great but it's still content uh <laughs> now remember Zach, remember in all the things that we might say, the most valuable thing to us is being able to interact with you. Yeah. And that's what we love the most. So keep the questions coming. Share your thoughts and experiences, ideas and insights. And if you're on the social media spot, share them there. If you're not, certainly you can go to agencyrunning.com. Find plenty of ways to interact with us there. YouTube. And while you are, take a moment to pause and click on the word coaching. Because that might just be the way to help get the next thing for you in your run, mm -hmm. perhaps. Well, thank you so much for joining us and we'll talk to you next week. 